Chapter 38 Leaving Big Sandy is the only thing on my mind. A new prison may be my doom, but it also has potential to be a new start. This is what I hope, anyway. Getting out of here is never promised. Even the R&D department is dangerous. That reality is reinforced for me today. Creeper, the first prisoner I ever saw assaulted here, was scheduled to be transferred today. His hands were cuffed behind his back, and he was led to the R&D department and placed in a holding cell with other prisoners scheduled to leave. Creeper was able to uncuff himself with a small piece of metal he hid from the guards. Prisoners call this slipping your cuffs. Sitting across from him is one of the people involved in ordering the hit on him months ago. Slyly, Creeper pulls a razor from his pants. One minute, he is sitting on the concrete slab. The next, he is running towards Chino. The look on Chino's face tells the story. He knows it's payback time. Chino doesn't make it to his feet. Creeper slashes at Chino's face. Chino struggles to get away. He makes it to the door, and he kicks hard to get the officer's attention. With his hands restrained behind him, he tries to protect his face by tucking it into his shoulder and burying himself into the corner of the wall. Like a wild Apache, Creeper slices up and down, yelling in Spanish like a man possessed. The guards respond by spraying Creeper with mace. Then they wrestle the razor blade from his grip to stop the wild assault on Chino. These two men should have never been scheduled on the same transfer trip. Because of Grand Prairie staff's negligence, Chino will forever have scars on his face. Their negligence presented Creeper with the chance he had been waiting for, so he got him some revenge. Chino was a high-ranking member of the gang that Creeper once belonged to. After his latest attack on Chino, he knows he is a marked man. Some might say a dead man walking. Like me, Creeper is in the hat. Kites will be sent to every prison. His name will be on them, marked for death. His only real choice is Coleman too. But like Miss C told me, Grand Prairie does what they want. Some prisoners like living on the edge. It helps them manage their time. It doesn't matter what you get into, really. Being involved in anything keeps the organic mind from thinking about the heartbreaking reality that is being separated from family members, the world, and society. This is what moves men like those willing to accept an order to kill Creeper. Some men in here consciously welcome chaos, violence, and conflict into their lives. At Big Sandy, the New Year comes in with a bang. I have spent Christmas in this cage, now New Year's. The prison is on lockdown. The guards aren't saying anything. This is usually a sign that something bad has happened. As Pike and I listen to the radio, we find out the reason for the lockdown and the baloney sandwiches from the newscaster. An inmate was murdered today at the federal prison in Inez, Kentucky. Staff members at USP Big Sandy reported that two cellmates were involved in a physical altercation that resulted in one cellmate stabbing the other with the prison maid shank. The inmate was stabbed in the head, resulting in the death of the inmate who was serving a life sentence. The dead prisoner's name and age is mentioned on the radio, resulting in prisoners hollering back and forth from cell to cell. Yo, Juice, you heard that on the radio? Yeah, that was Roscoe, Slim. Someone killed him. It was his celly, Slim, another voice calls out. Who was his celly? One of the homies? Yeah, he's from D.C. Just came from USP Lee for stabbing a dude over there. That's crazy, yo. How much time the new dude have? He got life. He killed some old dude who was a pastor in D.C. I can't believe Roscoe was dead, Slim. The Roscoe they are talking about lived in the same housing unit as me. Knowing someone personally and knowing that they were killed here leaves me in a somber mood. Death is possible for everyone here. It could have been me or Pike just months ago. Living in solitude until we leave almost guarantees that we will not die here. We may very well make it off this mountain. Like all lockdowns, the one for Roscoe's death ends in a few days. The violence does not stop. Chapter 39 Today will be the last piece of violence I see at Big Sandy. It's almost as if it is a going away present. Problems have been escalating between the Nazi lowriders, the guys aspiring to be California brand members, and the ABT gang in all federal penitentiaries. The brand has issued orders to all their members and the Nazi lowriders to hit every ABT gang member. Pinky never got wind of the order and doesn't know anything about the issues between his gang and his cellmate, Russell's gang. Swift and Dinky have. Pinky and Russell make it into a recreation cage with Swift, just one cage away from me and Pike. The men exchange handshakes. Dinky stayed inside today. Swift pulls Russell to the side for a brief conversation. Once the guards leave the recreation cage area, Swift punches Pinky from behind. Russell moves in to aid Swift in the assault. Pinky swings wildly, backing up. 
He doesn't know why his cellmate for months has joined up with the ABTs to attack him. Swift rushes Pinky, overpowering him. He picks him up and slams him to the ground. Swift holds him down as Russell slashes Pinky with a razor. A piece of Pinky's ear is cut off. The guards respond and order the men to stop fighting, but no one listens. Beanbag rounds are fired hitting Swift, knocking him to the ground. Guards rush in and spray mace on the combatants. The men are cuffed, then separated. Pinky is escorted from the cage first. He walks past us. Blood is dripping from his face. Those are your friends, bitch, Pike hollers. Pinky hears him, but does not respond. Through eyes watery from the mace that has reached our cage, we laugh at Pinky. Pinky was attacked because he is prospecting for the Aryan Brotherhood. Swift and Russell walk him into their trap. Being in the gang has earned Pinky 25 more years in prison and has stripped a piece of his ear from him. The ruthless prison machine respects no one. Seeing Pinky brutalized does give Pike a moment of happiness. He will never have a chance to avenge what Pinky did to him. Their paths will likely never cross again. Pike will eventually be sent to a state prison. Pinky will be here until someone kills him or until he is an old man. After lunch, I'm told to pack my belongings. I'm being transferred in the morning to USP Lee. I see the sadness in Pike's face. I feel the same emotions at the moment. With the time me and Pike spent in pretrial and now here in federal prison, we've become close friends, more like brothers. Like all things in prison, everything is subject to change. What do you really think about this place, Pike? For real, I don't even know what to think about this place, Pike snorts. Honestly, this is the worst place I ever been in my life. It's a fucked up life. I'd rather be in Afghanistan than this fucking rat hole. Afghanistan? At least over there you know who your enemies are. These dudes in here will smile in your face today and stab you in the neck tomorrow. Yeah, I guess you're right, Pike. You're out of here tomorrow. Now I gotta worry about them bringing me a cellmate. What are you going to do? I'm not taking no one, plain and simple. My life is on the line. I'll be in this bitch for a year before I make it to a state prison. You could take Martin, kid. He's your co-defendant anyway. I say this laughing. Pike rolls his eyes, but he laughs back. By the time I get out of this hole, I'll be as crazy as your stepfather, Martin. Fuck you, he ain't my stepfather. I say this while throwing two playful punches at Pike. Federal prison is an unforgiving world, with no remorse for anyone. The federal penitentiary can break a person. Like a machine, it will chew you up and spit you out if you allow it to. Many men have left here broken, empty, destroyed for the rest of their lives. Tomorrow morning, I will walk down this range battered, damaged, but still alive. Chapter 40 I see them jumping out of their cars. My first instinct is to flee. I think I'm being robbed until I see the shiny metal of their badges. It is the Rochester Police Department, narcotics officers. They rip me from the front seat. Rich jumps out of the passenger seat to run. The snow drifts down from the black sky on a cold February 4, 2003 night. Don't move. I'll blow your fucking head off. I am laying down in the street face first, wet from the ground. A cop's knee in my back. I am handcuffed. Life as I knew it, gone forever. I never been to Kentucky. Never seen blue grass. Big Sandy, here I am. Thank you.